Welcome to our MJA Inc. Investigations Podcast, Episode 4, Part 1, The Series, Deep Into the Woods, Human Trafficking of Children and Pedophile Rings. My name is Mark Harper, and I am a lead investigator and one of the founding partners of MJA Inc. Investigations. I am your host for tonight's podcast, Episode 4. This is Part 1 of Human Trafficking of Children and Pedophile Rings. At this time of the cases that have been reported, there are 1.5 million human trafficking victims in the United States. That's male and female victims. Up to 300,000 Americans under the age of 18 are pulled into or forced into the commercial sex trade every year. It's estimated that 14,500 to 17,500 of those victims are trafficked in the United States each year. The victim's average age is 11 to 14 years. About 80% of the children bought, sold, and imprisoned in the underground sex service industry are females. The average lifespan of a victim is reported to be 7 years. They're either found dead from an attack, abuse, HIV, or other STDs, malnourished, overdosed, or suicide. The largest group at risk are children who are runaways, throwaways, or homeless American children who are used for survival sex. Child traffickers have units that target such groups. Children are often targeted by traffickers because they are deemed easier to manipulate than adults. More money can be earned by younger girls and boys exploited in the sexual exploitation, especially virgins. Some female victims have reported to be injected with hormones to bring on puberty. Younger girls are expected to have a greater earning potential and as such are in greater demand. In the United States alone, at any given moment, there are 750,000 child predators that are online each day. Human trafficking has surpassed the illegal sale of arms. Human trafficking will surpass the illegal sale of drugs in the next few years. Drugs are used once and they are gone. Victims of child trafficking can be used and abused over and over. A $32 billion a year industry, human trafficking is on the rise and it is in all 50 states. Child victims of human trafficking face significant problems. Being physically and sexually abused, they have distinctive medical and psychological needs that must be addressed before advancing in the formative years of adulthood. Child victims have been exploited can face a number of long-term health problems, such as sleeping and eating disorders, sexually transmitted diseases, HIV, AIDS, pelvic pain, rectal trauma, urinary difficulties from working in the sex industry, drug addiction, chronic back, hearing, cardiovascular or respiratory problems from endless days of trolling the sex trade industry in dangerous places. Fear and in, and in anxiety, depression and mood changes, guilt and shame, culture shock from finding themselves in a strange country, post-traumatic post 
traumatic stress disorder, traumatic bonding with the trafficker. The info I just read to you came from U.S. government resources and non-government resources who are in charge to keep such records. In June 2006, I interviewed an, an Ohio inmate informant who was a cellmate of 1980s child serial killer David E. Penton. I have interviewed him several times through the years. The Ohio inmate informant is a child predator himself. He was living in the projects and he met a drug addicted couple who had a nine year old daughter. The inmate informant is serving 50 years for buying the nine year old girl for a carton of cigarettes and a bottle of whiskey. The parents of the girl received a 12 year sentence. Before I interviewed the inmate informant, the prison investigator showed me his file so I would know how to handle him. In his case file was a fake marriage certificate made by the nine-year-old girl at school. Yes, this predator sent the child to school. He had the child completely brainwashed with kindness because her parents were very abusive. The child predator and the child was together for almost two years. What was sad, there was a witness testimony from people who lived in the projects that stated the child predator treated the child better than the parents. School officials even reported during this time the child's grades went from poor to excellent. As we all know, there are hundreds of cases where parents traffic their own children. Some child behavior experts say many children's stories ring true. They have all the signs of being child victims being in a pedophile ring. This pedophile ring reaches several states. There is no way of these children could have read, seen a movie on this subject. It can't be explained the details in their statements unless they have lived through it. Okay, we are going to take a pause for the cause. And when we come back, we'll be interviewing Dan. Thank you. Welcome, Dan, to our MJA podcast, Episode 4, Part 1 of Human Trafficking of Children and Pedophile Rings. First, I want to ask, when a child is saved or rescued, how do children react not being abused? It might be very odd for them at first. Depending on how old the child is, there'll be varying levels of post-traumatic stress. Once you're groomed in a, an environment that's abusive, you'll do things like avoid making eye contact with people, even little things that you think might anger someone or set them off. You try to be as good and silent as possible, and it takes a while after you've been rescued to start to come out of your shell and once again be a part of normal society. It's something that, for most people, takes years of therapy and talking to people, counselors. It's not a short process by any means. And are there any signs that something might be wrong with the child? There could be all kinds of signs. Nightmares, bedwetting, any physical problems. They could do things psychologically, like hurt themselves. A lot of people, when they're being trafficked, Especially as they get older, they'll start to cut themselves or indulge in self-harm. They could have problems with drugs. That's 
a big thing, especially with uh, sex slave prostitution, because doing drugs makes it easier to perform those kinds of acts mentally. Because doing that type of work is degrading in itself. The drugs make it easier to perform some of those horrid acts. And then once they get them hooked to the harder drugs like crack or heroin, they don't have to use that threat of violence to constantly control the girls. Because, you know, once you're hooked on crack or heroin, you'll always come back needing more. Because if you don't get it, you'll get sick. And then anyone that's been in that situation, they know that when you get sick from that, it feels like a life or death illness. So you'll do anything to get your fix. And how long does it usually take a child to open up about what was going on? That's different for everybody. Obviously, if you could bring in someone similar to the victim, say a young black female, if you could bring in a younger black female detective to talk with that person, that works best. In basic FBI training, they teach you that whenever you interview somebody for anything, you always want to use somebody of a similar age, race, and gender background if it's possible, because that makes them more likely to open up when they see those similarities. Okay, I'm going to read you some statements that have been said by some of these children who's been rescued from pedophile rings and see if they ring true to you. And the first one is, is it true that some children have stated that most of the sexual acts against children were filmed and photographed? I would say a lot of it rings true, especially in today's day and age, because as we go deeper undercover, doing certain covert operations to find these people, the need for pictures and photographs becomes greater because they want proof that you're not undercover cop. So a lot of times what they'll do is they'll bait you into distributing photographic material or video material to prove you're a legitimate child trafficker. That being said, not every act is filmed because when a lot of these people are trafficked in their souls, so it doesn't require so much film as it does, say, knowing the specific age, race, and gender of the type of victim you want trafficked. Now, with the dark web being what it is, there's all kinds of access now to kids of any age that you could get illegally through the web, and it's hard to take down because a lot of these sites are based in places like Asia, the Philippines, over in Europe, where law enforcement jurisdictions have trouble getting to them and shutting them down. But the act of filming children in sexual acts is becoming more and more prevalent because you could access so much information through the dark web and file sharing sites that it's amazing. I once took a internet predator tracker, which you could do through uh, PI education. They're a very well-respected uh investigative teaching website and they offer certificates in many states for things like death investigation, identity theft, skip tracing, stuff like that for private investigators and they had a free course, you know, internet predator tracker and I thought, you know, I would just learn some of the more basic stuff about human trafficking and i tell you what, what I learned was just unreal about the number of pedophile organizations, what they do, how they set up Facebook accounts and use cartoon profile pictures to lure kids. It's just unreal. 
And with the advent of social media, it spreads that much further because just as fast as you could take it down as you find it, somebody puts it up that much faster. So and I don't know if the majority are photographed, but a lot of them are. And is it true that some children have stated at times they would have to dress up, and the details from the dress up, we have come to know it's something like an satanic worshippers. Yes, there are several people in high-ranking areas, especially within the government, accused of stuff like satanic worship and occult activity. And a lot of these children are forced to dress up. The offenders themselves wear weird masks and do like a whole devil ritual. It's been written about in books like, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Franklin cover-up. That was a very popular book. Ted Gunderson, a very controversial FBI agent who ran a, the Dallas field office, I believe it was, was big into conspiracies. But one of his biggest ones was the satanic worship and the sacrifice of children. And they talk a lot about that. I don't know if you've ever seen the videos from Bohemian Grove where they take children in the mass rituals and they're wearing masks and they sacrifice them because they truly believe in their hard hearts. They'll, they'll draw power from the dark regions of the universe. For whatever reason, it's unreal. And you don't hear a lot about this stuff because a lot of times they don't look as satanic crimes as even possible. As a matter of fact, if you look at the strength statistics, a lot of them will tell you that stuff like satanic uh, murder doesn't really happen that often, if ever. It's just a very little known about topic, but it does happen. And is it true that some children have stated that small animals were sometimes killed in front of the children to use as a fear factor? It's true it's done as a fear factor. It's also a deeper part of that satanic worship, whereas they believe that by drinking animal blood doing more weird rituals with it. They'll draw power from the dark side itself. Satan. And, and Satanists will say that they're not wicked, but there's video proof that this stuff is happening. And is it true that some children have stated during some sexual acts they had to watch movies of other children doing sexual acts? <laughs> It's true. Just like in regular sex, some people like to watch videos. Some pedophiles prefer to molest their victims to videos of victims being molested. Everybody's got their own thing. And is it true that some children have stated there were movies of children being killed during these sexual acts? It's probably very true. You look at places like Faces of Death and other websites, and they'll have material like this on there because it's not just about having sex with a kid. It's also about the visceral act of killing them, just like we've talked about with other serial killers like Ray Mac Edwards. They get sexual pleasure out of not just traditional sexual acts, but with the act of killing itself, strangulation, stabbing, really any form in which somebody could cause a victim pain and get off on it is a form of sexual sadism, which again is when pain itself causes the offender to become aroused. And is it true that some children have stated they knew who was in charge. 
In charge of what? The pedophile ring. Some of them have. Others are more reluctant to be identified, especially when a pedophile is in a position of power. They automatically feel like they won't be believed because the person's position in the community is so well respected that whoever was saying that they had something done to them would just be making it up. And is it true that some children holds a lot of guilt because now they understand that they were used by these child predators to get them more victims and at the time they thought they were playing a game. It's true. A lot of pedophiles will do that. They'll use children, their children to lure other children. I read in one case or was watching it on TV well, one girl from right here in the United States, I believe it was from Virginia, she thought she'd made a friend. She was, you know, regular high school age, I think about 14, 15. And she met this girl, and they were the same age, went to the same school. They were friends, hung out a few times. Well, this friend invited her over, and she met her dad, or who she thought was her father at the time, and then turns out she was taken captive for like a year or so, held in this house, trafficked by I don't know how many different men. And that's what usually happens. In other countries, it's real easy, especially with the massive influx of refugees that are going on throughout Europe and even as we've been talking about it to the United States. See, what happens is... When these countries go to war and these refugees seek another country, they're coming over here as illegal immigrants. They don't have any IDs or even a lot of times any family with them. So that makes them the perfect target for human traffickers because automatically they're coming over here with no paperwork, no family. So if they go missing, they're not going to be reported. And if they are reported, it's just going to be glass up because there's not several avenues they can investigate. And the way they do it is they take these people from the poor parts of the world, okay, like Mexico or Europe or Asia or wherever, and they use somebody their own age, and they convince them that they can make a little bit more money for their family because their families are very, very poor. And once they convince them of this, they believe they're coming to this good job, and then the next thing they know, they wind up. And then the next thing they know, they wind up in a cookie. So it's really, you know, a catch-22 because even when they're caught, they don't want to admit it because in their minds, okay, they're doing what's for their family. And who wouldn't bite the bullet for their family, being a, be a human slavery or they're, you know, working on a field, even the sex workers feel that way because, you know, it's money that their poor families don't have. And it's hard because I just got my hair cut. Even me and my barber, we were talking about this one show she watched where they're interviewing a human trafficker. And they brought out all the officials so he could sit there and talk about how he's murdered hundreds of women, but there's nothing the cops will do about it because they kick them back so much money in these larger parts of the world that they're all completely bought off. And in law enforcement class, that was taught by law enforcement professionals at ISU and ID Tech, and these were county sheriffs and FBI agents. And even in the textbooks, along with their lessons, they teach you stuff like when you go to Mexico or other countries in South America and you're in trouble, you think twice about calling the police because even the cops down there could be bought off. You could call the police after you got robbed, sit down in their car for an interview, and be taken away never to see again. So it's a, it's a very scary thing. All in prospect. Okay. I know that was a little bit long-winded, but 
<laughs> That's fine, Dan. Thank you very much, Dan, for being on this podcast. We're going to take. Thank a you pause. so much for having me. We're going to take a pause for the cause, and we'll be back in a moment with our second guest on tonight's podcast. Her name is Callie, who is a profiler and researcher for MJA. Callie knows the dynamics of human trafficking of children and how pedophile rings operate. Please stand by for Callie. Welcome, Callie, to our MJA podcast, Episode 4, Part 1. Human Trafficking of Children and Pedophile Rings. Can you please tell our listeners what happens to families' well-being when law enforcement and the courts won't listen that your children have been sexually abused? Well, hi, Mark. Glad to be here. Um, And yes, that question is very... Um, marking. It's like a branding almost. Um, It's a painful experience and it causes helplessness. It's overwhelming and disparaging. Um, Being re-victimized by having told the truth and exposed oneself openly and the whole family um, and being isolated. But all the time that a person was doing that they have felt trust in the justice system that but the justice system was not there for them and like the child that trusted the abuser in the beginning so it's it's a complete circle and that broken trust and anger that becomes internalized and stored for one's lifetime and overcoming that betrayal is a hard thing to surpass society does not want to deal with these things when the topic is broached in a conversation, Joe or Jane public, uh, or even your relatives, well, they look as though their underwear has been turned around with them in it. Okay. It is an uncomfortable truth that one, no one wants to talk about, but it must be talked about. And it's never going to end until it is. And it needs to be brought to an end by exposing it for what it is. And have you ever had to deal with child victims of sexual abuse? Yes, Mark. Um, Victims in my work with victim services and the training that they provide, as well as my own and my children's life experiences. I decided that since life handed me and my children women's, I was going to learn as much as I could about women's. So that instead of being enraged and bitter... I was going to be outraged and try to make a difference for other people, for my own children, and for myself, and even my grandchildren. I have also worked with victims in adulthood and seen their growth emotionally and developmentally. It's a painful journey, but worth it in the end, and it is a good thing to see, and it makes, it makes you glad when you see that turn. And do you agree with some of the U.S. government resources and non-government resources that these children have a long recovery ahead and still can have issues in adulthood? Oh, absolutely. A long time. Um, But there's hope in that, as long as it's not buried or ignored, but dealt with and one reaches for all the tools and information that they can find and get. Ignoring and burying sexual abuse, um, the shame plays a huge role in doing this. I liken it to laying a floor down that you're going to walk on every single day of your life, but it's not nailed down. It's just laid down. And eventually it's going to bring to your attention that the boards are loose and smack. It's going to smack you in an ongoing way and you're going to experience that whole thing. Even though you don't maybe recognize it at the time for what it is, it, you will eventually get it. You're going to get down, you need to get down and examine 
what needs to be done. It's not your fault. It is not and never has been your fault. Uh, this is where the abusers use misplaced responsibility as a tool to manipulate and secure the victim. Recovering is a living thing to learn to cope with and to learn to rise above it and regain your dignity and your self-worth. That broken trust is like a broken back and you need to learn how to walk again. Even after the initial healing, it's hard to, tr to trust and expose yourself to the persecution or ridicule or misunderstanding and even sometimes your own self-persecution. Um, embracing your brokenness is most difficult, but it is the only way to truly move forward and heal and regain what's rightfully yours, and that is you. You keep living, if you keep living in that reaction world where your everyday occurrences and everyday events that you respond to in pain, that's not healthy. And uh, finding your way back to yourself and respecting yourself again. Uh, looking in the mirror each day helps. Several times a day, when you look into those eyes that are looking back at you, and you look right into those eyes, and you tell her or him that they are good and a worthwhile person, and you tell them that you love them. You must instill in yourself what the abuser has taken. You break all the chains that bind and you that have bound you to being a victim because you're no longer a victim, you're a winner. And it's the biggest fight and the biggest battle of your life, but the most worthwhile thing you will ever do. And Callie, from what you know about child victims of pedophile rings, what are some of the ways it affects their mental mm. health? Oh, um, that's all over the map, and there are just so many ways um, that this plays out. Each person develops a protection or exhibits a fallout of their very own, like it, 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 it fits to their specific person. Oftentimes the victims are trapped developmentally at the age that the abuse began. Um, therefore, like their reasoning abilities are arrested at that point. So even in adulthood, they are unable to reason things out in a rational or stable manner. Um, with help, that can be released, and watching that person spring into adulthood is absolutely wonderful. Then there's repressed memory syndrome, where a child is told at the age of five to forget something, and you need to really be, you, you do a really good job of it at five because you feel responsible at, a, at age five. And then you're into your adulthood, things start to happen and you start forgetting simple things like how to spell was, um, just odd little things. And, and then one day a major event happens like 9-11 and where catastrophic things happen and suddenly you're met with a huge scary memory freeze. Like, where am I? Who is that? Where am I going? Uh, you know, your selective memory can no longer distinguish what is possible that was at one time you were supposed to forget. Um, it, it's not selective anymore. I highly recommend the memory testing um, to rule out any other health issues in that case. But I do know that art therapy helps with that. Can't say enough good about it. Um, it gives you the backboard as if you're playing tennis. It comes to you. And you're going to know um, what that is. So also, uh, you can go on functioning. And this is why all the justice system should uh, the justice system should never put a stipulation on a time limit um, for childhood sexual abusers to be charged because 
people use that mechanism. That mechanism is an instinctive thing sometimes where it can come in and it's a self-preservation thing too. It can allow you to function and live in your life. And then, bang, you know, it comes up where it's dislodged and, and you need to go through that. And then there's multiple personalities. Now, I believe they're a survival tool and the mechanism to, to soothe the pain and divert is any possible responsibility that the other personality cannot handle. A coping mechanism, as I see it. Oftentimes, children are indoctrinated into a pedophile ring uh, by making them feel responsible for what is happening to them or to other people. Misplaced responsibility adds to the shame and prevents them from wanting to tell anyone about it. And then there's self-isolation. You are ingrained to believe that you're not worthy. Shame and misplaced responsibility, and that in itself isolates the emotions and keeps you from thinking normal life is for you. Your normal is not society's normal. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many other things that adulthood is affected by. Okay. When a child victim comes forward or escapes, what do you think could have been their breaking point to take such a chance? Well, I'm going to go back to those floorboards, and I think... Oftentimes, one of those comes loose, whether it's just lodged by a personal catastrophe or a worldwide catastrophe. It's going to come up, and there is a glimpse within of something that's not right. And Let's say a child is saved. What are the chances of that child making a complete recovery and became and become a productive citizen i'd say it's a very good chance um the recovery is a lifetime event and it isn't an overnight uh, experience recovery once again is a lifetime event a learning and unlearning process and it's ongoing um productive oh my yeah, most people um, are probably more productive um, because strife in itself brings a great deal of productivity. And once one is free from the oppression and then learning their self-worth, and that can take a while too, but learning their self-worth, all that helps to, helps too because then you're not being used and you the light is there. You can see and you, and you can learn that you're worthy and that sometimes that can take a long time. Like I said, the self-worth, knowing that you're worth while, a worthwhile person. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Kelly, for taking part in episode four, part one of Human Trafficking of Children and Pedophile Rings. We look forward for you to join us for part two. Thanks and have a good night. That's the end of part one of Human Trafficking of Children and Pedophile Rings. In the coming months, as our investigation moves forward, we will announce when part two will be coming out. And always remember, folks, if you ever get bored, Take a walk deep into the woods. You might be surprised what you might find. Thank you for listening, and good night from Plattsburgh, New York.